welcome everyone. So I will make a seminar about uh, the Hest telescope in Namibia and the quest uh, for the sources of cosmic ray. Uh, KTV asked me to introduce myself before uh, the talk. So I'm Mathieu de Norois. I uh, made a PhD in astrophysics in a Celeste experiment in the south of France in 2000. I'm a researcher at the CNRS in France and teacher at Ecole Polytechnique. And I'm working in the field of very high energy gamma ray astronomy. Uh, mostly in the S experiment and a little bit in city as well. I've been director of the HES collaboration for three years. I'm now deputy director. And I've been participating to the ISP series since the first one, which was in Stellenbosch, uh, South Africa in 2010, uh, where I teach uh, astroparticle and cosmology. And I received a silver medal of senior in 2017. So uh, I will introduce uh, the question of cosmic rays first. So you might know that the Earth is uh, continuously bombarded with uh, very high energy particles that are coming from the cosmos and which are dubbed cosmic rays. And those have uh, numerous implications. In particular, they are an evolution accelerator through genetic mutations. They are uh, the reason why there is uh, carbon-14 created in the atmosphere through the, uh, the transformation of uh, nitrogen uh, being hit by a cosmic ray. And so that uh, the, the, the amount of uh, carbon-14 is more or less constant in the atmosphere and is incorporated into, inside the biomass. And since carbon-14 is radioactive, this allows to date the time where the living material like, actually dead, uh, died and uh, stopped accumulated carbon-14. Uh, there are many secondary particles that are produced in the, in the atmosphere when this uh, particle interact. And this led to many fundamental discoveries starting from the 1930s, in particular, the discovery of the positron, which is the antiparticle of the electron in 1933 by Anderson. Also the discovery of muons, kaon, epsilon, and many other particles in the following years. Cosmic rays are also responsible for the people being irradiated when they travel in play. And this is the reason why the amount of time the crew can stay uh, on board is limited on an uh, annual basis. There might also be seeds for lightning and they might be also helping forming the clouds uh, to form. So this is actually a center mystery. And uh, the, the name we remember for the discovery of cosmic ray is Victor S, the guy with the mustache that you see here on the balloon, uh, who actually um, flew up to five kilometers above the ground with an electroscope and it showed that the amount of uh, ionizing particle was rising with altitude so that these particles were actually not coming from the ground as they were previously expected, but coming from above. And this is here, an except from this, uh, the measurement it did, uh, as you can see from the middle column up to four, four kilometer, 400 meters roughly. And then, he actually uh, took the opportunity of uh, uh, sun eclipse, uh, solar eclipse uh, in April uh, 12, 1912, and showed that uh, during this eclipse, actually, the flux of cosmic ray was not decreasing, which helped also rejecting the hypothesis that those cosmic ray could come from the sun. So the, the, the two facts, the fact that uh, this, the flux was increasing with altitude and that it was not shadowed by the sun, was a very strong hint that they were coming from the cosmos. And he received the Nobel Prize in 1936 for this discovery. In the following years, so the different people actually repeated and, uh, this measurement and extended them. And in particular, uh, Werner Kölöster uh, repeated the observation up to nine kilometers above the ground and uh, really confirmed those observations. You can see on the plot on the right, where you have the measurement from Kölöster in 1913 and 1914 where you clearly see the, 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 the rise of the flux of uh, ionizing particle with increasing altitude. And then using different technologies, and in particular using Geiger counters instead of electroscopes, it was shown that those particles were genuinely charged and not neutral particles uh, traveling in the atmosphere. And this was published in the Science Magazine in 1930. So this brings me to the questions about uh, what are the cosmic rays? And now we know that there are mostly protons, which form the, the, the atoms, uh, atomic nuclei up to heavy elements, and also electrons, the light particles that are the, the constituent of matter. 
uh, which would be accelerated in astrophysical objects. And you see here on the bottom right plot, uh, the, 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 heavy nucle the nuclei that are present in the cosmic ray in black compared to what we have in the solar system in blue. And you see that for many elements, uh, the abundances of so the relative flux are similar, but there are some discrepancies. In particular, there are many more beryllium, boron, and lithium in the cosmic ray than in the solar system, as well as elements a bit below the, the iron. And this is caused by heavier nuclei being um, broken, one says, elated by uh, uh, light uh, by a uh, lighter particle uh, when they travel uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, interstellar medium. There are also some antiparticles in the cosmic ray, so there are anti-electrons, positrons, and possibly anti-nuclei. There are also anti-protons, uh, which are produced by the interaction of the cosmic ray with the interstellar medium throughout their journey uh, in the galaxy uh, towards the, uh, the Earth. And as I said already, the composition is quite similar to that of the solar system, with some exceptions. Now looking at the energy of the cosmic ray, and uh, this is actually, this box here is, is a, a quite a impressive one, uh, which shows that there is an incredible range in energy, more than 10 orders of magnitude, up to macroscopic energy at the highest uh, energies, so the energy of a tennis ball in a single particle. And the, 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 the the flux varies by more than 30 orders of magnitude. And this uh, law, this physical law, appears to be extremely regular over this uh, very large extent, which indicates that there are uh, kind of, uh, let's say, um, single mechanism uh, or let's say a universal mechanism explaining the acceleration of particles. The origin of those particles is still not completely well known. In particular, the low energy, or not low energy, but up to 10 to 15, up to 17 electron volts, the particle can be produced in the galaxy and will be confined by the magnetic field that are pervading the galaxy. Whereas at the highest energies, the particle cannot originate from the galaxy itself. They have to be coming from the outer space, the extra galactic space. So uh, the goal is actually to try to understand where this particle originates from and try to pinpoint the source. And this is not completely trivial. So there are many possible candidates that have been identified through the, the last decades, such as supernova remnant, which are remnant of the explosion of massive star, active galactic nuclei, which are nucleus inside galaxy uh, where matter fall, falls inside, but any of many of the astrophysical objects that I will discuss afterwards uh, that could actually produce those cosmic rays. But the point is that uh, the, the interstellar uh, medium is actually full of magnetic fields, which means that the charged particle, the cosmic rays, would not travel straight from the source towards the Earth, but will be bended by the magnetic field. So they will not, they will arrive at the Earth with an isotropic uh, direction distribution, and they will not allow to pinpoint the origin uh, of the, well, the source where they were produced. So this is the reason why we look at uh, neutral particles, and in particular, gamma ray photons, which can be produced also at the source or very nearby, and which have the advantage that they travel straight, so they allow to pinpoint the source. So that's the main reason why we are doing gamma ray, gamma ray astronomy to understand this uh, physics of cosmic rays. So just to have a quick insight about uh, how one can accelerate particles uh, in particles. So uh, in fact, only neutral a charged particle can be accelerated and they are accelerated by electromagnetic fields. And there are two main mechanisms. One in a single shot mechanism where you need a very intense electromagnetic field in a single source. And one example of that are the pulsar, which are a compact star of about three kilometer in diameter orbiting very fast uh, with a magnetic field which is not aligned with the rotation axis, resulting in a dynamo effect. And those uh, objects, which are kind of lighthouse in the universe, can possibly accelerate particle up to, let's say, 10 to 12 electron volts or so, because they can generate differential of potential of the order of 10 to 12 volts and could hardly actually uh, exceed those values. The other possibility is what we call as a kind of image, uh, an astrophysical ping pong, 
where a particle actually bounces back and forth on uh, magnetic field walls. And every time they hit a wall and they bounce back, they gain a bit of energy. And then uh, time after time, they will increase the energy. And if you look at the right plot here, then we start with a distribution of particle. After one shock, we have a bit less particle of higher energies and so on. And we get after so, the succession of uh, many different, uh, many successive um, shocks, less and less particle, but of higher and higher energies. And this naturally results in a power law distribution as we see uh, in the flux of cosmopolis. So those are the two main mechanisms to actually, actually accelerate particle within the astrophysical sources. Of course, the reality is much more complex than this simple picture, but this is a, a, somehow how it works. And then one needs to actually produce neutral particle, such as so gamma ray photons, which can be observed at the Earth. And for that, there are two main uh, channels, let's say. For protons or nuclei, which are accelerated at the source, they can interact with the matter and the radiation around the source, and they can actually produce pions, which are meson particles made of a one quark and one antiquark. Some of them are charged positively or negatively and would produce neutrinos and muons. Some are neutral, they're called the pi zeros, and they would decay into two photons of high energy, which would then travel straight. In the case we have electrons and positrons accelerated at the source, there are different mechanisms which can lead to the production of gamma ray. And one is called the inverse Compton, uh, where the idea is that the, the, the electron uh, scatters, hits a photon of low energy and gives the, the vast majority of its energy to the photon. And we call that inverse Compton because this is the same mechanism as the Compton scattering. But in the Compton scattering, it's in high energy photons that would give its energy to an electron from the medium and here we have the reverse. We have one electron, which would give its energy to a photon from the interstellar uh, medium. So this could be an infrared or uh, photons, uh, visible photons, or a photon from the cosmological background. And there are other mechanisms such as Bremsstrahlung, which can also lead to the production of photons, but these are the two main ones. So the, the main questions this uh, domains uh, try to answer are quite many. Uh, what are the sources of cosmic rays? What are the acceleration mechanisms? What are the type of accelerated particles? Is there possibly some new physics in there? In particular, are there dark matter particles which would annihilate into photons? How do these high energy particles propagate inside the universe? And there are also, the, also connection to fundamental physics. In particular, we can have a kind of measurement of the speed of light at different energies, which we call Lorentz invariance violation. We could also possibly look at annihilation of dark matter. And there are also links with the cosmology, which is the organization of the universe at a very large scale, because we can have measurement of the amount of light that was produced in the early universe through the, the, the look of gamma rays. So what are those gamma rays? In fact, uh, we are talking about light, but some kind of invisible light. And if one would represent the known electromagnetic uh, spectrum like a piano, it would be a piano of about 15 meters, so 70 octaves, in which the visible light actually represents only one octave. So the light that we see with the eyes is just one of out of the 70 octaves that we know in the electromagnetic radiation. And looking at how the universe shines in different wave bands, actually, we see very different pictures. So the visible light, and the visible lights, the, the, the universe is mostly made of uh, hot objects, such as uh, nebula, stars, and so on, which shine just by thermal radiation. Then if we go to X-rays, uh, typically a factor of 1,000 above the energy of the visible light, then we have uh, very compact objects, which are uh, much hotter than the, the previous one, typically 1 million degree, which can also produce uh, just uh, light by thermal radiation such as the, the pulsar, the environment of black holes, such as accretion disk in particular, and which would have size of the order of a few kilometers. So very small object, but very hot. And we also have non-thermal radiation from particles that are accelerated, typically electrons in magnetic fields. If one go now to the, goes to the lowest energies, 
Then we also have a thermal component, which is uh, produced by a cold object in a microwave. So typically uh, interstellar dust. And on top of that, we have also emission of uh, radio emission of particle uh, spiraling in a magnetic field that we call synchrotron emission. Now going to the gamma rays and to the highest energies, uh, uh, we will have an extreme object which would shine by non-thermal processes. It's not possible to have thermal emission at those energy because the amount of energy would be uh, much too excessive. Uh, so which is produced by particle being accelerated in astrophysical shocks in particular, and which produce then the gamma rays through the mechanism explained already. So inverse Compton, Abraham Schralung, pion, neutral pion disintegration, and so on. So just to give a scale of these different energies, the visible light, every light grain that we call a photon carries an energy, which is typically one electron volt. In the X-ray, every photon uh, carries of the order of 1,000 electron volt. In the microwave and radio, in the, the radio, we are typically uh, uh, 1 million below the energy of the visible light. The microwave, it's even less. And now if we go to the right, the energy that we are looking at with the HES telescope, we are typically looking at one tera electron volt, which is uh, 1,000 billion times the energy of the visible light, so 12 zeros. And now we'll introduce the detection technique, which is called the imaging electrospheric chain cough technique. Whoops, sorry, what happens? I have a problem with my slide, just give one minute. I will have a shot. It stopped, I have to restart it. So I had a crash, sorry. I will restart where I was. Yes. So uh, this uh, figure here gives you uh, the altitude where half of the radiation is absorbed, uh, which indicates what type of radiation we can actually use, or what astronomical windows are accessible from Earth. And as you see, in fact, there are not that many. Visible telescopes, which correspond to this band here, can operate from the ground. There is a tiny window in infrared, and then radio telescopes are usually operating from the ground because the atmosphere is opaque to is transparent to radio, to, uh, radio uh, radiation. In contrast, uh, infrared, UV telescopes, X-ray telescopes are usually space instruments because the atmosphere absorbs completely those radiations. In the high energy gamma ray domain, it's a bit intermediate because actually the gamma rays can penetrate inside the atmosphere up to a few 10 kilometers. And we can have there a window where we have an indirect uh, detection from the ground or from very high altitude through the production of showers of particles, which I will describe now. So when a high energy particle enters the atmosphere, it will interact with a nucleus in the upper atmosphere, so nitrogen, oxygen, or whatsoever, typically at 10 kilometer altitude, and would produce a pair of electrons and positrons. Those particles will further interact with all the nuclei in the, in the atmosphere and will produce secondary gamma rays by the so called Bremsstrahlung mechanism. And there you have in blue those gamma rays, and in green, the remaining charged particles, and so on. So the, those produce gamma rays will again produce pairs of electrons and positrons. And by this mechanism, you will develop actually a shower of particles in the atmosphere, which extend over several kilometers and which redistribute the energy to a very large number of particles. Sorry, I have really a problem with my... I hope it will not uh, crash all the time. It was working perfectly yesterday. That's really strange. I normally don't have such problems. So, sorry. OK, 
Do you see my slides again? Yes. Yes, we can see the slides. Okay. So there you have a numerical simulation of uh, such a, a shower of particle developing uh, over 20 kilometers in the atmosphere. And one important aspect is that uh, the, the atmosphere is a transparent medium in which the light actually travel a bit slower than in the vacuum. This is not much. This is typically 0.01%. In contrast, in the water, the light is actually, the light velocity is reduced by 30%. But this is enough to make it possible for the particle to travel faster than the light in the atmosphere. And this would lead to the production of a shock wave that we will call the turing cough radiation, which is the analog for the light than the sound wall for a plane. So typically when a, fly, a plane, plane flies faster than the speed of sound, there is a sound which is emitted at each time in the form of a cone at which accumulates the energy and which propagates forward. This uh, mechanism, this phenomena is actually common to every wave phenomenon. You can see that, uh, for example, for two ducks uh, uh, just uh, uh, on the surface of a lac or lake, or uh, you can see that also for high speed boats, such as on the bottom right. And you can see that also for a plane traveling. Okay, so you saw also this uh, shock wave, this compression waves uh, on the, around the plane, which is due to the fact that it's traveling faster than the sound in the air. So the Cherenkov light is this equivalent. So this is a bluish light, uh, which is emitted by the particle which travel faster than the light in the medium. And this is actually uh, visible, for example, in the cooling pools of nuclear reactor. Uh, which shine in this blue light, as you can see on the right here. So this is possible also in the atmosphere. And uh, so the particle can, can uh, emit light in the upper atmosphere as it travels faster than the light in this medium. And this is this kind of light that we try to capture with this uh, very large telescope in this so-called atmospheric sunshine graph technique. So in summary, we have the primary particle, which can be a gamma ray or a charged cosmic ray, which enters the upper atmosphere, interact with the uh, nitrogen of the atoms, generate a shower of particles in which the electrons and the positrons travel faster than light. Those particles emit this blue cone of light, which has an opening angle of the order of one degree, which will illuminate the surface of a football field, but during a very tiny amount of time, typically one billionth of a second. So the goal is uh, for those telescopes to capture that light with fast camera and to make the image of the particle uh, shower uh, traveling in the atmosphere. And this is uh, somehow, uh, this, what this shows what kind of image we will record. And this uh, is somehow similar to uh, what you would observe uh, when uh, sitting on the ground and looking at meteor. It's a kind of uh, elongated image, which is produced by an object emitting light in the atmosphere. Okay. So the, the very important factor for the, those telescopes is the, the velocity, the speed of the camera. And this is illustrated here on the plot that is supposed to come <coughs> there. Uh, if you uh, would integrate over a time, which is 100 microseconds, which is already quite fast for a camera, uh, you would see just noise, nothing, the noise produced by the stars and uh, the ambient light. And once you start to decrease the, 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 the time of exposure and you reach nanosecond time scale, then you can start to actually see the images produced by those showers in the atmosphere. And this is what you see here appearing with this uh, blue, uh, this uh, region here in the camera uh, for an integration time of uh, not more than 10 nanoseconds. And this is one really uh, very important aspect of those cameras. So now switching to the uh, HESS High Energy Stereoscopic System, uh, which is uh, an international consortium of 14 countries, including Namibia and South Africa for the African uh, continent. The site is uh, 100 kilometers away from uh, Windhoek, close to the uh, Capricorn Tropic. 
because uh, we went there because of the excellent sky transparency, uh, the medium altitude, typically it's 1,800 meter above sea level and the very dry weather condition, but also because uh, it's in the Southern hemisphere and this allows a direct view on the galactic center and the central regions of the galaxy where we expect most of the high energy gamma resources to be located. The telescopes actually follow two different, so the array of telescopes follow two different phases. The first phase actually was inaugurating in 2003 and was consisting of four telescopes of 12 meter diameter. So the mirrors you see them is 100 square meter each with a camera, which is basically one ton uh, made of uh, 960 pixels. So that's not many pixels, but uh, the point is really the very fast integration time and uh, a field of view of each camera of five degrees. And then in 2012, we added this very large telescope in the middle, which is the largest optical reflector in the world with 28 meter diameter, 600 square meter of mirror. And the camera here at the center is a three by three by three meter cube of uh, 2000 pixels with a field of view of three degrees, uh, which allows to actually detect the fainter showers corresponding to lower energies and to extend the range, the, the dynamical range of the instrument. So just to have a look at the camera, you see that the, this is this uh, uh, metallic box here. This is the camera of the large telescopes, uh, which have been since then replaced, but this, this was until last year, the, the, the camera of the, the large telescopes, which is uh, three by three meter, three tons. And you, with all the electronics in the back side, as you can see on the bottom left plus, uh, plot, and then on the bottom right plot, you see the, the PMT, the photo multipliers, which are actually the light sensitive devices and which takes uh, of the order of 4,000 photos per second. So what are the events that are recorded by the camera? They look like this. So these are actual events taken by the telescope. When you see that in the center, this is the images seen by the large telescope. And the four other ones are the images seen by the, the four telescope on the same events. So they, they, they see the same shower, but from a different perspective. And you can actually see that there are different types of images. Some of them are completely irregular in shape. Some of them are rather elongated. And some of them show also a clear circle, uh, which is uh, very well visible. Just there was just one there. Okay. So this corresponds to a different particle type. And then we need actually from these images to infer the particle type, its direction, its energy, and its impact around the telescopes. So these are these kind of images that you saw. Uh, a, a pure circle is a single particle that crossed the mirror of the telescopes. And <clears throat> this corresponds usually to muons, high energy muons. And then actually the, the radius of the circle gives the energy of the mirror. Then uh, irregular showers correspond to hadronic particles, typically proton or nuclei, and uh, well-shaped uh, uh, regular ellipse, more or less, uh, usually correspond to the Newton camera. So we are to extract the different type. Uh, we have to extract a different uh, type of images to actually select the gamma rays, and then to actually start to, to look at the sky in gamma rays. So now I will show a few results. Yep. So yeah. again. It crashes every time I have an animation, but sorry, can I can I ask yes, a question? Of course. Yeah, so what exactly is this is there this difference between like the muon and the proton? In the image that the telescope records. So where the, those particles that are actually uh, reaching the atmosphere in random order, so there are gamma ray coming, there are protons coming, the muons are produced in the showers. And uh, when they reach the particle, they produce, when they reach the, well, when they emit light in the atmosphere, they emit a different distribution of light, which is captured by the telescopes. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay, so uh, I will now continue uh, and start with the, a few of the Milky Way and gamma rays, which was a, a major project lasting 10 years from 2004 to 2013. Of course, I will not be able to show the, all the results that are produced by the, the, the HES collaboration. I will select just a few of them, the most emblematic ones. And this one is really a, a very emblematic project because it corresponds to uh, 3000 hours of observations, which is basically three full years. And we observed a strip uh, in latitude uh, along the galactic plane, which is this uh, white square here. 
uh, from minus uh, 130 degree to 70 degree in longitude and plus minus five degree in latitude. And if you look at the blue plot here, these are the time spent on every position. And of course, it's not homogeneous because there are some regions of the Milky Way where we spend much more time because of specific interest, for example, the galactic center. So this is now the, the view of the Milky Way in gamma ray, and we will fly through the Milky Way. So you see that there immediately that there are actually many different uh, gamma ray sources along the galactic plane. Some of them are rather small. Some of them are several degrees across. Now you see the galactic center. Some actually uh, have a shape of a shell, more or less. Some of them are much more irregular. So you see immediately that there is actually a very uh, large diversity of sources which would correspond to different astrophysical objects. And then I, I will discuss a bit. And there, for example, you have one which is uh, very shell-like, uh, looks really like a pure circle, which corresponds to a, a supernova remnant, that is uh, the remnant of a star that exploded a few thousand years ago. So to make a summary of the type of object that we see in the Milky Way, uh, we have the supernova remnants, which are, uh, as I said already, the, the residual of uh, an exploded star. The region, very specific region, which is the galactic center, where there is a supermassive black hole. We have also a pulsar, which are this uh, rotating neutron star, uh, which uh, act like a lighthouse in the universe. And they can also produce the nebula around them, which we call pulsar wind nebula, that I will discuss later. There are also binary system, and there are also other objects. In particular, there is also a diffuse gamma ray emission across the galactic plane. So, just to illustrate that, there you see an artist view uh, of a supernova explosion. So when a, very, when a massive star explodes, it generates a shock wave, which will uh, sweep up uh, the interstellar medium at velocity of more than 1,000 kilometers per second, so very fast. Uh, these can emit uh, thermal emission from the very hot material inside the shell in X-ray because it's around one, one million degrees. This is the place where the heavy elements are produced. So this is more or less at the origin of life. The amount of energy that is released by the explosion is actually uh, enormous. This corresponds to roughly 10 to 44 joule. And so that uh, during a supernova explosion, in fact, the supernova itself will outshine the whole galaxy. And those are the best candidates for galactic cosmic rays for several reasons. First, because the, the, the rate of explosion of such star is uh, compatible with the amount of cosmic ray that we receive on the Earth. Typically, there is one supernova explosion per galaxy, such as the Milky Way, per century, one to three, roughly. And if 10% of the energy of the explosion goes into cosmic ray, this would be sufficient to explain the, the flux of cosmic ray on the Earth. And this is one of the reasons we believe they are the, 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 one of the best candidates. So there, there are actually uh, quite several of those objects which are seen, which are seen uh, in uh, very high energy gamma rays. And there you have example uh, on the right, where the same object is looked, uh, is seen in X-ray and in gamma ray. And one uh, sometimes you see very similar morphology in the two wavelengths domain, which indicates that the same particle can give rise to the two emission. And it looks like those can actually uh, accelerate the particle up to 100 TV. So with, uh, in the last years, and using also a space instrument such as the Fermi telescope, this uh, kind of view emerged. So it might look completely massive for you. So this is the energy so on the horizontal axis of the energy of the gamma rays from giga electron 100 mega electron volt to 100 tera electron volt, more or less. And on the vertical axis, you have the amount of energy that is released in every band. So the plot here is looks a bit messy, but if you start to actually start uh, sort the supernova remnant by ages, then it becomes a bit more clear. Very young supernova remnants, which are historical one and which exploded less than 1,000 years ago, roughly, 
are mostly uh, uh, shining in the giga electron volt domain and not too much in the very high energy domain. And this is probably because the, the, the particle did not have sufficient time to accelerate up to the highest energies. And then intermediate uh, supernova remnant are actually uh, outshining in the very high energy domain. Uh, and this is at the time where they have the maximum efficiency. And when they become older, then the shock wave slows down in the interstellar medium. The uh, particle acceleration efficiency decreases and those objects cannot accelerate particle to the highest energy any, anymore. So they become now again, they outshine in the GV domain and not in the highest energy anymore. So this is an example of what we can do by using different instruments at the same time on those objects. Now having a quick look at the galactic center, uh, the galactic center that was originally observed with FES uh, gave this first picture where there are two point-like sources, which are actually two star wind nebula. And when we subtract those sources, uh, we see this diffuse emission across the galactic plane, which is correlated to the amount of uh, interstellar matter, which is traced here by uh, CS molecules, but there are different tracers available and which correspond to these uh, white contours. And the way we interpret that is the fact that actually particles uh, produced around the galactic center diffuse away and uh, interact uh, with the interstellar medium and produce neutral pi zero, neutral pi ions, which subsequently decay into, uh, into gamma rays. And then uh, uh, having uh, looking at with a deeper exposure on the same region, uh, we obtain this following picture where on the bottom left, uh, you see uh, the diffuse emission across the galactic uh, plane. And then we looked at the surface brightness or so the amount of energy per solid angle as function of the distance to the galactic center. And we were able to show that actually uh, the, this was consistent with a single source at the center being more active in the past and uh, producing particle up to the beta electron volt. So this would be for the moment, the only pivotron that we know. So the central black hole was uh, likely more active in the past, was uh, uh, accreting particles. A fraction of them were accelerated to the highest energy and released. And then they would actually diffuse away from the galactic center. Now looking quickly at the pulsar wind nebula, just to explain a bit what those objects are. So the general idea is that you have a, a pulsar at the very center, which is the leftover of the explosion of a massive star. So you have the supernova shell, which is expanding away, but the, the residual, the final residual is a pulsar, which is a neutron star orbiting at a very large velocity. Uh, the, some of them make uh, one orbit per millisecond and which uh, the remnant of the magnetic field of the star, so which uh, they, so they behave like a lighthouse, and they can actually uh, accelerate uh, electrons and positron particles and release them, which forms a kind of wind of particle. And this wind of particle generates a vacuum inside. If I show the video again here, that on the right, you see that the, the, very, the pulsar that is at the very center here, the small dots, and you see the wind of particles that are emitted here uh, the, from the central pulsar, which can shine in X-ray. So you see those uh, fluctuation in X-rays and which creates this uh, vacuum here around. And there those uh, electrons and positrons can also uh, uh, interact with the, the ambient light and produce uh, by inverse Compton gamma rays. And actually many of the sources that we observe uh, in very high energy gamma rays are such pulsar wind nebulas. This is the largest population of high energy sources in the Milky Way. They are very irregular shapes. They are uh, most likely electron accelerator. So they have this very complex shape due to the interaction with the environment. And the bottom left plot is actually a quite interesting one, which shows on the horizontal axis, the age of the pulsar, on the vertical, the power of the pulsar, and you see that uh, the youngest one and most energetic ones uh, all have a pulsar wind nebula around them. So then you need young and energetic pulsar to produce such synchrotron nebula. Now looking quickly at the central engine of those objects, the pulsars themselves, I said already this, that they are compact objects, neutron star with high magnetic field, high rotation speed. Typically, 
they have a size of, a, of the order of 10 kilometers, the size of Paris with the mass of the sun. And they can rotate uh, with period between milliseconds and seconds. And those ones are very complex physics because of the rotating fields, uh, but they are really uh, uh, very, uh, very important object of, uh, of studies in the domain. Last type of uh, sources I would like to discuss briefly in the Milky Way are binary system. Uh, because you might know that uh, more the, the vast majority actually of the star in the galaxy lives in couples of two or more, 70% of the stars. And you can have a binary system when uh, there is a compact object, either a black hole or a neutron star, and a massive star orbiting around each other. And then I uh, will show the video again. You see that the, the compact object can actually accrete the matter from the star. So this is an artist view. And the matter from the star will spiral and fall onto the compact object, either the neutron star or black hole. And sometimes this would generate the jets of plasma on both sides of the, of the disk, uh, which actually uh, can accelerate particles and uh, produce also gamma ray emission. With, uh, and this is in a kind of complex physics with system which can vary as the two objects uh, orbit uh, around each other. And there are five such objects known so far. I will just uh, describe one, which is actually a, a very interesting one, which is just to illustrate what kind of, what kind of physics one can do, which is called LS5039, and uh, which uh, actually allowed us to show that the light can be opaque to light. So let me explain this. Uh, we have a very massive star here, uh, which is 20 solar masses and very hot, shining in UV, because the star is at uh, 17,000 Kelvin. And then there is uh, the black dot here, which is a compact object orbiting around this star. And this object is actually the one that produces gamma rays. And then what we observe, so here you have the position of the observer. I don't, I don't know if you see my mouse, by the way. Uh, yes. and what we okay, so what we observe is that uh, when the compact object is behind the star, the, uh, uh, the emission is actually uh, dimmed completely. And when the compact object is uh, in front of the star, which corresponds to the inferior conjunction here, then we see a much larger fluxes of gamma ray. And the way we interpret that is the, the main mechanism for that is the fact that when a gamma ray produced by the compact object encounters a photon from the star, it can be absorbed and destroyed uh, through the production of a pair of electrons and positrons. And this is much more favorable when the object is behind the star because it's a head-on collision. So the available energy is the highest. Whereas when the, the inferior conjunction that the two photons goes in the same direction and both the probability of collision and the amount of energy that is available are much lower. So the gamma ray photons are less absorbed at this position. So this we see a modulation of the absorption of gamma rays by interaction of, of uh, on low energy photons from the star. And still we have now uh, many objects for which uh, we don't know what they are uh, because they have no counterpart of, uh, in any other wa wavelengths. So there could be also hidden sources of cosmic ray or there could be sources of the same types as what we have seen so far, but which would not be visible anymore at other wavelengths. Now I will uh, go to the extragalactic uh, space. So I will uh, skip the slide that makes things crash, hopefully, and go directly to the, this one, okay? Uh, so uh, on the top uh, plot here, you see the distribution of sources across the, the, the sky. And we discussed uh, all the sources that are aligned along the galactic plane with a different type of sources. Now I will discuss the remaining red dots and orange dots, which are not along the galactic planes. And they belong to mostly three categories. First, active galactic nuclei, uh, which I will describe, then starburst galaxies, and last but uh, not least, uh, gamma ray bursts. So what are active galactic nuclei? Uh, those are uh, supermassive black holes, typically 1 million to 1 billion solar masses at the center of uh, an elliptical galaxy, uh, which are surrounded by an accretion disk, which is a matter that is uh, spiraling and falling onto the black hole that can generate two jets of plasma, uh, which can exceed in size the size of the whole galaxy. Okay, so there on, the, on this uh, artist view, now you see the, the illustration of the black hole, the creation disk around, and these two jets of plasma 
emerging from both sides. So the, there are different types of active galactic nuclei, mostly from the, due to uh, the orientation, their orientation with respect to us. In particular, so there are two main categories. Some are those jets of plasma, and they are called radio loud, so they emit a lot of radio due to the jet. And some are radio quiet, so they don't have jets. And so they are uh, then uh, not uh, shining in the radio very much. Uh, in general, this is uh, for this sketch shows you the two different types, but in, uh, in general, when you have one jet, you have two jets. So either you have two or zero. And then if you have one of those radio loud objects where you look directly into the direction of the jet, then the jet outshines everything. In particular, you don't see neither the galaxy nor the accretion disk anymore. And these are called blazer. And they have a very variable emission on very short time scale, no less than a minute sometimes, which can be used to check that uh, the speed of light is uh, really a constant, which is not depending on the, the energy of the light itself. And so far, we have not been able to actually uh, show the variation of the speed of light with the energy. So there are many studies uh, that perform on uh, all of these objects, on the radio galaxies, which are seen from the edge, uh, where to, we can use that to actually try to locate the origin of the emission. Uh, the blazer directly to try to understand the mechanism and so on. But I will skip those things and uh, now come to the, to the end. So um, radio galaxies uh, are seen from the side, uh, such as uh, this one, which is called Centaurus A, where, which can be used to actually locate uh, the uh, region of the emission. And we have shown that this is actually very close to the central black hole. It's slightly elongated, but very close to the central black hole. It's not uh, the giant uh, lobes which are created by the interaction of the jets uh, with the uh, intergalactic medium. There are also some galaxies which uh, are called four star burst galaxies, which are galaxies which are forming a large amount of new stars and in which we have a lot of supernova in a short amount of time. And then what, what you have uh, been uh, able to show is that uh, they, they can shine in uh, very high energy gamma rays and the, the region that shine is the very center of those galaxies corresponding to the region of uh, large uh, starburst formation uh, activity. Now, the last topic I will briefly discuss are the gamma ray bursts because this is one of the most recent results. And the gamma ray bursts are actually the most violent and the most distant explosion in the universe, which can last between a few seconds to a few minutes and which are observed almost every day. And there are two uh, envisaged mechanisms. Uh, one is the coalescence of neutron star, uh, giving rise to the so-called uh, kilonova and which was uh, re really uh, brilliantly confirmed by the gravitational wave interferometer uh, in 2017. And the other one is the collapse of a very massive star, which is also called of the collapse star, uh, which uh, gave rise to, to actually uh, longer camera bursts. And this is uh, there again, uh, an artist view of such a collapse star where the massive star collapses. And then uh, inside this, um, the, the star a jet of plasma is formed, which would uh, transpose, uh, go through the envelope of the star and would uh, interact uh, with the uh, interstellar medium as well. So there have been uh, recent discoveries of TV gamma ray burst uh, announced uh, very recently. In fact, there have been three of them. And uh, I will just discuss the, the two most uh, uh, the recent uh, the observed by Hess. Uh, one occurred during the July uh, 2018, the last one uh, during uh, August 2019, and this one was published in Science uh, one week ago. And uh, what is actually very interesting is that uh, we saw the observation lasting much longer than the, the, the gamma ray burst itself. For the first one, uh, the emission was observed 10 hours after the initial burst, and it was one of the most intense ever seen. And the second one, we actually saw the decay over time because it was observed during more than two days. And in both cases, this is the actually, uh, we, what we observe is the so-called uh, remnant phase, which is the interaction of the jet of plasma with the interstellar medium. And this was really the, the first proof that uh, gamma ray bursts are very efficient particle accelerator as well. So I will stop here uh, just to, so in fact, uh, uh, my main conclusion is that uh, the, the, in the last um, 15 years, roughly, a new window on the high energy universe has opened, uh, which is made of a very unusual sky, sky made of uh, young, a uh, few thousand years only, 
and very violent phenomena, which is something you don't see in other wavelengths, uh, which uh, is uh, characterized also by many uh, transient phenomena, uh, lasting sometimes a very short amount of time, between a few minutes sometimes, and which also uh, imply a colossal amount of energy. And I will uh, finish with this uh, beautiful video showing uh, the HES telescope made by uh, a professional astronomer, uh, Vikas Sundler. And then we can have a discussion. Um, Mathieu, thank you very much. Um, um, there was a question on the chat, which may be answered, may have already been answered, but I will mention it anyways. Uh, Toivo was asking, what is astrophysical object? Well, uh, an astrophysical object is um, anything that you can have on the, uh, in the sky. Uh, a planet is an astrophysical object. A star is an astro astrophysical object. A galaxy is an astrophysical object. So most of it's a kind of generic, generic word to actually uh, talk about uh, objects that are uh, evolving in the universe. So it's really very generic name. But uh, in, the, in the case uh, of gamma ray astronomy, the, the objects which uh, then uh, appear to shine in gamma rays are either the residual of the explosion of star or those pulsar wind nebula, which are the nebula around the pulsars or binary system or active galactic nuclei and so on. And all of them I classify as objects, let's say. Okay, um, other questions or other comments? Well, this is this is really a great. This is Herman White. This is really a, a great uh, presentation, and I, I really learned a great deal. I wonder if you could tell me, and I it's very complicated, you know, with the history of our universe. But is there? Do you think that there's any capability of seeing a differential between electron and positron uh, interactions in, in in the cosmos? I mean, from the point of view of matter antimatter balance. Uh, well, uh, not from the ground. Uh, because electrons and positrons will produce exactly the same shower in the atmosphere. So we, right. can't, uh, we can't access the difference between them. Uh, space instruments such as uh, AMS, uh, which have um, uh, a magnet and uh, a tracker, can actually differentiate between electrons and positrons reaching the neighborhood of the Earth, and then measure the fraction of positrons. And this is actually used to uh, put constraints on dark matter because uh, this is linked also to the, the, the propagation models. Uh, we expect some positron to be produced through the interaction of cosmic ray with the interstellar matter. And we can calculate that for a given model of propagation. And we can compare that to the amount of uh, positron that we observe on the Earth. And uh, actually, the, there is a hot topic currently, which is the fact that the, the fraction of uh, positron seems to rise with energy, which is uh, not expected from classical propagation models. Right. I don't right. know whether this uh, actually answers really your question or not, but the oh, only yeah, no, way- no, that's, that's perfect. Yes, that's yeah. perfect. I, I, was, I was just very interested in, when I was seeing that one of your dynamic uh, pictures showed uh, essentially either a, a, a black hole or some type of heavy mass object moving around a star, I wanted to, to think that maybe there was some lack of symmetry between something that seems to have a very strong uh, gravitational center like a black hole versus mm -hmm. a star that's sitting there and whether the dynamics really is something that uh, is fundamental to, to what, our, what we know about science or whether it's just the way in which we observe it. There it's more, in those cases, mostly the way we observe it. There is, we cannot mm -hmm. really access uh, some fundamental uh, symmetries or so. Thanks so much. Um, other questions? Other there comments? is one question from Francisco Macubule uh, in the yes. chat. I would like to know how he's made the study of gamma ray sources because I understand when the gamma ray interact with the atmosphere, particles are formed. And is the particle that we can image a source, for instance. So that's not exactly that. So this indicates that I did not, it was not perfect in my explanation. So uh, a single gamma ray interact in the atmosphere generates a shower of particle. And the photo that uh, the telescope record correspond to the one event. So these images, in fact, are the, the let me show this image again. 
uh, those ones. So this is the photograph made by the telescope of the full shower of particles. And they correspond to one single particle entering the atmosphere. So there we have identified the, the, the one on the right as being a, a gamma ray photon. So we have the one photon that uh, reached the atmosphere. And now if you accumulate for hours and hours and hours, then you can make a map of the sky in gamma ray, such as this one. This is the accumulations of uh, millions of events that allows you to do so. Okay, so you take photograph of the showers, you, you discriminate or differentiate between the different type of particle. And once you have selected the gamma rays, then you can start to, and you know where they're coming from, then you can start to accumulate them and produce such a map. That more clear like this? Um, yeah, he cannot talk, so maybe um, um, other questions or uh, other comments? I first want to say that, uh, you know, well, much can I ask more? Yes, if, of course. Yeah, so yeah. the direction of the source of this uh, radiation is uh, defined like uh, in the direction where the uh, uh, the detector are uh, like directed or something else. Or yes, something. yes. Um, in fact, so uh, for every uh, set of, of, of observation, uh, we have a field of view of, let's say, five degrees. So there you see that it's correspond to roughly that square here. Okay, you see my mouse? Yes. So this correspond to one observation. Okay. And if we spend sufficient time on this, we will have a map of gamma ray in this region. And then if you accumulate many different runs taken on different nights, even different years, uh, and taken with the telescope looking at different position across the sky, then we can degenerate this uh, composite map which extend over a much larger region, okay? But we superimpose the, the, the observations of many, many, many hours together. Thanks. So I, uh, for people uh, who don't know, uh, Mathieu has been uh, a frequent le lecturer at ASP since uh, 2010. So he has been uh, supporting us for a very, very long time. Um, and also, Mathieu, if I understand correctly, he is the spokesperson of HES. Mathieu, not anymore. Still, eh? not, not anymore. anymore? Not anymore. Ah, okay. So he was until recently the spokesperson of HES. So he, um, he has been to Namibia many times and has uh, been involved in the development of uh, the HES telescope and the data analysis and student supervision. So he he knows uh, Africa very well. And it's um, always a pleasure to come. Yeah. So Toivo, you want to, you have more questions? Yes, yes, I have. Uh, firstly, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I learned a lot about the uh, gamma ray. In, uh, I have a question here. I saw that uh, we have a, a short windows for, for visible rays, a wavelength and the radio wavelength, but we don't have a for gamma ray. And I didn't understand how or why we have a, a telescope in the ground for gamma ray. Uh, this, you mean you're talking about this one? Exactly. Okay, so let me say it again. Uh, there actually, what you see is that radio wave reached the ground. Uh, there is a small window of infrared radiation which reaches the ground as well, and visible reaches the ground, and you see the world invisible, so this is something you know. Gamma rays, they do not reach the ground, so you cannot detect the gamma rays directly with a gamma ray, uh, let's say, uh, camera. This is a reason why we look at the showers of particles in the atmosphere. So the gamma rays, they enter a few tens of kilometers in the atmosphere, but they do not reach the ground. They produce those showers, uh, like this ones, uh, which uh, develop in the atmosphere and which we can direct, detect indirectly by the light they emit. Okay, but there you see that the, the primary uh, gamma ray, uh, which was the first particle in blue, is not reaching the ground. It's dead uh, at 10 kilometers above the ground, roughly. Okay, does it make it more clear? 
Yes, now, now it's more clear. But see, here in, in this shower, we have a, a part called like Muyang. And the Muyang, we you know that have a, a short time, time, time of life. Yes. And I, I would like to know how we detect this, this Muyang because they, I don't know that we may collect a lot of Muyang in, in the telescopes because uh of the time. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, in fact. Uh, so the muons are mostly produced in the shower, which are generated actually by protons and nuclei. And this is a slide I did not show here, but th there you have a showers of particles initiated by protons. And there on those plots, the blue lines correspond to photons, the green to electrons and, pro and positrons, and the red to muons. So you think that there are actually many muons which are generated in those showers. So you are perfectly right that the moon is a short lived and should not reach the Earth. But you forget about something, which is the, the dilatation of time due to relativity. The, the, these moons are very highly relativistic. So their lifetime is extended by a factor of thousands of millions. And by this, uh, just this Lorentz uh, dilatation of time, they can reach the ground. It's just because they are highly energetic. Uh, so we don't use the uh, Newton equation to, to find the time of living of these muons. We have to use dilatation time. You have to take into account the Lorentz factor. Do you know what the Lorentz factor is or not? Uh, I think not. OK. So uh, the, this is the, the energy divided by their mass. So in fact, uh, a, a muon at low energy, I don't remember, will lie for 100 microseconds. No, that's correct. And yeah. if you, no, how much? The muon at low energy, this lifetime is 2.2 2, uh, microseconds. 2.2 microseconds. <coughs> okay, and this is for a muon of 100 mega electron volt. Now, if you take a muon, which is at one giga electron volt for a factor of 10 larger in energy, its lifetime in the observer frame, in uh, our observer frame, not in the, the muon frame, in the laboratory, would be a factor of 10 larger. And it will be able to travel uh, for a distance 10 times larger. And if you take a muon, which is not at one giga electron volt, but one tera electron volt, then it will actually uh, have a lifetime extended by a factor of 10,000. So it will be able to travel kilometers before decaying. Okay, so the highest the energy, the highest the lifetime of the particle in the Earth's frame. You understand it? Yes, thanks. Now I get it. Thanks. And actually, uh, there are muons uh, which are, can cross several kilometers of rock. Even if you make underground experiment, you still have uh, muons coming from above, which uh, can survive after distances of several kilometers. just due to this uh, dilatation of time. All right? Uh, so, so I just, I just have a, a doubt, but uh, I don't know that uh, it's something that uh, we didn't talk here, but I just want to know that we have a telescope that we can detect in a dream to do image of astrophysical spots using neutrinos. Using what? Neutron. Neutrons? Yes. Uh, there are uh, observatories which should try to identify neutrons, but which are a space detector, such as in, uh, in uh, Pamela and in IMS as well. There are not many neutrons actually coming from space. Uh, first, because there are neutral particles, so you don't accelerate neutrons. Uh, there are the subsequent production due to the interaction of cosmic ray with the interstellar medium. So you can have some neutrons which are produced, but the second point is that the neutrons are not stable. So they, uh, they decay after 30 minutes. So if they have a very high energy, they can, for so using the same uh, dilatation of time effect, uh, travel large distances. But uh, if they are not at very high energies, then they would decay. So there are, uh, I don't know actually what the flux of uh, neutron is and what you can do with them. But Thanks, for us, uh, they, for us, they would look like just like a proton. They would make a yes. similar showers. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. So, other questions?
Mathieu, could you comment a little bit on the future of hers? And there is, there is uh, the... So, uh, um, currently, yeah, go ahead. yes, S is uh, going to operate uh, until October 2022 for the moment. And we are in the process of uh, the uh, discussion of an extension phase, an additional one, up to 2025. And then there is uh, an, another project, which I did not really mention here, which is called CTA, uh, which is uh, an international project, uh, which would take over with two sites, uh, one in the Canary Island uh, and one in South America, mm -hmm. in Chile. But so for, is, um, is, is Africa still, in, it will be involved in CTA in Namibia and- the, uh, so, uh, South Africa is involved in, uh, in CTA, Namibia, I don't think so. Uh, maybe it's a, a few researchers from UNAM. I don't know whether the Nukri, uh, you know about that better than me, no? Okay. Um, other questions, uh, other comments? So Namibia was a candidate site for, the, for CTA, but uh, Chile was chosen instead. Yeah, yeah, I remember the history a little bit about that. Um, yeah, but 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 the, the square kil kilometer away is coming. I understand it's a different regime of uh, of searches, yeah. right? Ah, yes, completely different. Yeah. The, the, the square kilometer array is in the radio. It's mm. a very nice project, but it's at the other end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, other I... comments, or other question. So, Mohammed. Other question? Yes. Is there like a future project for uh, for Africa for detector like his? Uh, in gamma ray astronomy, not for the moment. There are other astrophysical projects such as uh, SKR, but uh, not in gamma rays. And then um, the Mercat telescope, uh, which uh, would be deployed uh, in Namibia and South Africa, and I think uh, up to Middle Africa, in fact. Okay, thanks. Uh, Wait, but the, the, the Miekat is, uh, is, is just a stepping stone for SKA, right? Yes. Okay. It's one type of telescopes of SKA. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, other questions or other comments? All right, so um, we're going to get Mathieu back at some point to also talk to us about uh, cosmology and uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, we will also uh, review this talk when uh, there is more participation. But yes. uh, um, Mathieu, thanks very much for, for being available for, for, for giving us this talk. There are a few students, but the one that are connected here got a lot out of it. So if we, we manage to empower one student, that is still progress. So yes. I really, I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much in any case. And it was a pleasure for me. So um, let's, uh, people who would like to, you can open your, micro, uh, your, your, your video uh, so we can take a screenshot. Oh, Mathieu, one thing is that uh, if you can send us your slides, we will- Yes, uh, of course, I will. Post it. And uh, we will also, um, we will also uh, put the recording on, okay. the, on the agenda page. Can you cut the time where was uh, where the stuff was crashed, or is it too you don't care? Uh, no, it's, I think I think it's fine. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I can do it, but uh, I don't think it's it's it's, it's necessary. So let okay. me. Uh, uh, I will just put the link to the the slides in the chat window. Okay. So you can download them immediately. Oh yeah, I mean, you is that the same link you sent me before? There hasn't been any change? Uh, there have been a few changes, so they take okay. this new link. Okay, very good. All right, I'm gonna take the screenshot. All right, um, so there was a few other colleagues. Uh, there is uh, there is uh, Mukri here, and uh, uh, I think there's uh, uh, I uh, he probably left already. Yes. Uh, so I'm not sure if you want well. to say anything or not. Uh, sorry about that. Mukri, you want to, uh, is there any message you want to give us? Um, no, thank you. I have no message. All right. So Mukri is actually working. Nice to... Sorry? In, well, you are working in South Africa. So but I don't know if the students know you already or not. 
Um, no, I don't think so. So maybe you can say a few words on what you are doing in South Africa. Um, <laughs> <No>? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm associate professor at the University of the Witwatersrand, and well, I'm very much involved in Hess as well. And what I'm mostly doing is galactic objects uh, with Hess, and in particular, which is slightly off uh, the the Milky Way, it's Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a small galaxy which is um, related to the Milky Way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Satellite of the Milky Way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Are you also involved in the SDA or not? Um, no, but I. I started a few months or a year ago with a project um, on the Meerkat data. So mm. Meerkat has done a survey of the Milky Way as well. And now the idea is to match that with what we can see with Hess, if mm -hmm. we see the same objects in, in the Meerkat data as well. Okay. But this has just started. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, uh, very good. It's it's nice. So uh, thanks for coming. I um I didn't know you before, but it's it's nice to to know of you. Uh, maybe you can uh, lecture also at ASP. Uh, you know, for us in the future. So, but there are quite a large number of colleagues actually in both uh, South Africa and Yunnan. Yes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. In Yunnan, you know. Them. Yeah, Yunnan, Yunnan. I know the people there who are involved in this, but in South Africa, yeah, I know a few. Mm -hmm. Few colleagues in in doing astrophysics and cosmology in South Africa, but I didn't I don't know Mukri before, so I'm I'm happy to yeah, that he connected. So uh, okay, very... all right. So on that note, uh, we can stop here, and uh, thanks everybody for your participation. Well, thank you very much, Kedivi, and thank you, thank you all. Yeah, bye -bye. thanks a lot. Good to see thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes.